Dear Professor Jean Tirol, dear Vice Rector, dear colleagues, dear guests, on behalf of the Geneva School of Economics and Management at the University of Geneva, I am delighted to welcome you to this year's Luigi Solari Lecture. Since 1979, the University of Geneva has been organizing an annual public lecture in memory of Luigi Solari, who was a pioneer in introducing research in econometrics in Switzerland. As a professor at the University of Geneva from 1964, he was the first to teach this discipline in Switzerland. In 1966, he created a research center for econometrics, which later became the Department for Econometrics at the Faculty of Economic and Social Sciences, and then the Institute of Economics and Econometrics at the Geneva School of Economics and Management. When Professor Solari suddenly passed away in 1977, Nobel laureate Professor Sir Richard Stone wrote in a tribute to him, Professor Solari had a passion for economics and for making it a reliable, practical tool. Since its first edition in 1979, the Luigi Solari Lecture has featured many notable distinguished speakers, including Nobel laureates Bengt Holmström, Jan Tinbergen, Richard Stone, and Robert Engel. This year, we have the special honor to welcome Professor Jean Tirol to the Luigi Solari Lecture. Jean Tirol is a professor of economics at the Toulouse School of Economics and is known particularly for having received the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for his analysis of market power and regulation in 2014. Professor Tirol will speak about the common good after COVID, a topic that is not only highly relevant and timely, but also fits perfectly to our school's mission to educate responsible leaders and to have a positive societal impact. Dear Professor Tirol, we are extremely excited that you are with us tonight and that you will speak at this year's Luigi Solari Lecture. Thank you for coming. Before giving the floor to you, I would like to ask my dear colleague, Professor Jean-Charles Rocher to come on stage. As a longtime co-author of Professor Tirol, he is in the best position and in a much better position than I am uh, to introduce his life and work. Professor Rocher will also moderate the Q&A session following the lecture of Professor Tirol. Dear Professor Tirol, we are very much looking forward to your lecture. Thank you all. Thank you, Marcus. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, the 2021 Solari Lecture. Uh, and I'm very, very moved that uh, Jean, my old friend Jean, is the recipient of this uh, lecture. Uh, when I tell people that I've known Jean for uh, 30 years, more than 30 years, people don't believe me. It cannot be true. So I show them this picture. So Jean is easily recognizable on, on the right because he has not changed a lot. The problem is that nobody recognizes me on the, <laughs> on the left. And incidentally, the person in the middle is our uh, dear friend and colleague, Jean-Jacques Lafont, who passed away prematurely and he was uh, really the founder of the Toulouse uh, uh, School of Economics. And uh, we always uh, think of him uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a lot of nostalgia. So Jean is not only an exceptional researcher who has contributed to create entire new fields of research in economics, such as industrial organization, regulation, contract theory, microfinance, etc., but he's also an institution builder. He has continued the project that was launched by Jean-Jacques Lafont, and he has created in Toulouse one of the best schools in the world in economics. But he has also created the Institute for Advanced Study in, uh, in Toulouse, which is a unique center for the social sciences. He has published more than 200 articles in uh, international economic, uh, academic journals. He has written many 
uh, bestseller books that uh, I recommend uh, to I recommend to the to the students on so many different topics like uh, the theory of industrial organization, uh, game theory, and more recently he has written this uh, bestseller book, Economics for the Common Good, on which I believe he has uh, is basing part of his uh, presentation today. Uh, in fact, Jean is really one of a kind, you know. Uh, Eric Maskin, another Nobel laureate, always tells that when he started to teach at MIT, in his first class, Jean was sitting, he was a student there, and Maskin was scared because Jean was asking so many uh, difficult questions that Maskin had to prepare much harder than he thought <laughs> to answer this question. Similarly, I talked to Bengt Holmström, another Nobel laureate, and he told me that he, when he was working with Jean on a series of uh, papers that would uh, revolutionize microfinance, uh, he didn't have the time to read the notes that Jean was writing. So every morning, Jean would come with a, a, a set of uh, notes and ask a bank to read them during the day, but it was too much. So, so I guess if there was a kind of Nobel Prize squared, you know, a Nobel Prize given by Nobel laureates to one of them, uh, I think Jean would be a natural candidate. More seriously, let me finish by a personal uh, note. Uh, when I was in Toulouse, I was very lucky because my office was opposite to Jean. And one day, Jean was looking for somebody to help him uh, developing a new topic in research. And he came to my office and said, would you like to work with me on two-sided markets? And I said, Jean, I have no idea what you're talking about. But the answer is yes. <laughs> and this was the best decision I took in my professional life because it was the start of a fantastic scientific adventure. So I'm very grateful to, to you, Jean, for uh, giving me the, this unique opportunity to, to work with you. And uh, without further ado, the floor is yours. So John Thank you, Marcus, and uh, thank you, Jean-Charles. Uh, uh, you're from a very dear friend and a very valued courser. Uh, it means a lot. It means a lot, and I really appreciate and um, I welcome the representative of the Saloy family. Uh, of course, he was a great economist, and, and that's very important to continue the tradition, and also the, the colleagues uh, from the university and also from outside. Uh, the university who are here, and also the students. Uh, so it's wonderful to be here for this lecture. Um, by the way, coming back to Jean-Charles' uh, point is that, uh, you know, having wonderful courses, uh, faculty and students was uh, one of the biggest chances in my life and uh, of huge amount to them. And it was not a random move when I crossed <laughs> Jean-Charles' door because I know what I was doing. And if I, if I have some credit at the one, I said, uh, I know how to actually be with good people and fantastic people and I've learned a huge amount from them. Um, so, Common good, uh, common good after COVID. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about, it, about COVID, but you know, most of it will be about the common good. Starting with the definition of, uh, of the common good, of course, and what it delivers. Then trying to think about Weltanschau, uh, or worldview as economist. You know, what does it mean to be an economist? Um, it's not an obvious uh, proposition. I mean, you know that politicians, civil society, religious leaders, uh, and uh, philosophers and others have criticized economists quite a lot for their emphasis on markets and on uh, incentives. So, um, and I would like to address this issue because I deeply, I, mean, I feel passionately that economics is a moral and philosophical science. Uh, I would of course have to defend that. Um, and then I'll move on to the role of government and also what hinders good government policies because in many areas we are very far behind what we should be doing in terms of uh, fighting climate change, it's a obvious case, but you know, fighting inequality, uh, make, providing a good education for all and so on and so forth. I mean, I could have a list like this of failures, not only of the market, but failures of government. And, 
And the question we have to ask as economists is, why is that? You know, we propose policies, they may be right or wrong, but at least they have to be discussed, why even very consensual policies are not ad adopted. And therefore, we need to think through what is going to be an issue um, with, with what we propose. So, that will be, uh, but let me start with the common good. Uh, the common good start from the, the fact that there are many situations in which right interest diverges from, from the, the general interest, so that can be the right interest of of us, of consumers, households, citizens, of firms, of the state, of countries. So we know that uh, we as citizens, we don't always behave well, we emit carbon, we drive too fast, we refuse to be vaccinated, we consume antibiotics and so on and so forth. We look for our own self-interest often and not necessarily for the general interest. Business, they actually take too much risk. Uh, jeopardize uh, the amount of its workers or for a bank the savings or maybe the taxpayer money is a bit out it's going to abuse uh, monopoly power um, and then um, you know the, the state may also go against the public good the common good through excessive spending poor education not fighting inequality tolerating financial crisis or creating financial crisis and of course countries we live in a in a world of populism now, my country first is a big, very big thing everywhere, and you see it in global warming, trade wars, fiscal competition, and like. So the common feature you have all guess is really that the private interest trump trumps the general interest. Um, the ambition of the economics of, uh, for the common good is really to build economic institutions that are going to help align uh, those actors' concerns with the general interest. So you, you there are two ways of doing that. The first way is to employ persuasion. So you can try to convince people, firms, governments to behave better. Um, you can uh, call for corporate social responsibility or socially responsible investment and so on and so forth. You can design what sociologists call norm-based interventions in which uh, you try to give some facts about uh, basically the impact of some behavior or maybe the prevailing norm in the community so as to change the behavior. And that has been done sometimes successfully. But that's never going to be enough. Um, and actually, there's only so much you can do without incentives. I just take climate change. It's fair to say, I mean, in my view, that 30 years after Rio, almost 30 years after Rio, we haven't done anything, to be honest. I mean, I'm very, very critical, but you know, we are way, way beyond what we should have been doing. There's a huge amount of greenwashing by governments and private sector. So, um, you know, it's one thing that you can basically um, try to change the norm and say you should behave better because, you know, the, the planet is, is burning, but, you know, in the end, people have to change their behavior. If you don't put incentives in there, it's not going to work. And it's not only climate change, there are many other examples where it's with the case. So you need incentive to put a common good at the center of our life. Um, you can sometimes combine um, persuasion incentives. So for example, I was kind of pleasantly surprised when in France and more generally in Southern Europe, uh, basically we, uh, we combine incentives and persuasion together in order to achieve uh, reduction in, in, in tobacco smoking, in smoking in public places. And that worked better actually than I, I would have thought, to be honest. So, so there are some good news sometimes. So, but what is a common good? Because in the end, we need to have some compass for our behavior and for public policy. So the best we have, in my view, is an old tradition which is called the veil of ignorance. It's a thought experiment. You ask yourself, I'm not born yet. I don't know whether I will be a man or a woman, uh, whether I will be born in a rich or poor family, in Geneva or, or in, Bombay, in Mumbai, or you know, what my sexual preferences are going to be, what uh, school I will go to, et cetera, et cetera. And you ask yourself, what kind of society would I like to live in? And you might say, 
I, I would say it's very important to do that because we all have different positions in society. And like everyone, I have my vested interest in some policies because I have a position, I know what my position in society is, and you too. So we have to abstract ourselves and just say, I'm not born yet. What kind of society would I like to live in? Now, this is not easy, but you know, it delivers already a number of things. Uh, but before I discuss what is being delivered, I will say you need to consider incentives. So I'm not proposing a la la land in which you know, people will be so nice, you know, they will devote themselves for society, they will sacrifice themselves for society. This is not the world we are ever living. Remember the Soviet Union, which started, at least for some people, with a generous idea actually to change the man. At the time, this was the man, the new man. So we wanted a new man. And you know, the, the idea is that you know, that would be a much more harmonious society with people uh, who will not be selfish, but actually will construct a socialist society. And it was a nice, a nice idea except that it didn't work and very quickly, and you know, that was not random, very quickly actually that became an authoritarian regime because you know, they didn't, that didn't deliver what they were expected to deliver. And they had to prioritize a number of things and then they had to employ uh, you know, various, uh, various, and that ended up in a complete disaster on, the, on societal, cultural, environmental, etc. And of course freedom. Um, was a disaster just because they didn't incorporate the notion of incentive in their design. So it's not a la-la land where you could change um, the mentality complete, completely of people, but you know, what could you achieve with a long-term vision and without prejudging instruments? That, that seems very vague at this stage, but you know, what I always observe is that uh, you know, people often talk about policies per se, as postures, like markers. Uh, you know, basically, you like this thing. People don't even ask anymore whether it's efficient or not, or whether it achieves a goal, the initial goal. You know, we care about consequences. I will come back to that, but not so much about the instrument you use. This simple approach already has a number of implications. Like, first, you want economic efficiency because you want to deliver the income that is needed to have a good health, a good education, a, a welfare system, and so on and so forth. So you need to have a decent standard of living. So you need many things. I mean, here I just give three examples, you know, banking regulation, competition policy, good legal framework, but you could go on and on because you like to be in a reasonably rich country if possible, so as to be able to afford all those public goods. You need a number of insurance mechanisms uh, because, you know, there are, of course, randomness in life. So you might be born with a risk of a, a genetic disease, a cancer, whatever, and therefore you need to have universal coverage to ensure against that risk. Um, and that's very important. And here in Switzerland, I understand that you know, even so you have private insurance, you also have you know, no, dip, no discrimination. You are not allowed to discriminate depending on, on the health condition. We should have equal opportunity. Um, so behind the veil of ignorance, given that you don't know whether you'll be born here or there, in a rich or in a poor family, you would like to have equal opportunity. That's kind of obvious. Same thing with other inequalities, like gender inequality and so on and so forth. Income and wealth, of course, you need some inequality because of the incentive part, but you know, still you want to keep it limited. Um, and then societal re regulation, uh, all kinds of tolerance vis-a-vis -vis people who are different from us. So, the basic view of the state here is the state as fixing market failure. So, I mean, it's actually the society we live in since Adam Smith and over the last two centuries, we have the market as where to achieve efficiency and then we have the state as fixing market failures. Um, now, markets. I mean, even what I said in the last five minutes is already should already be perceived as, as uh, some kind of personal view. Uh, because I said, you know, markets are nice, they have failures, we correct those failures, okay? Um, there are views which are not quite the same in civil society, for example, or in religions, um, which say, oh, we distrust markets, we distrust more broadly incentive, because 
a market is a specific kind of incentives with very different uh, viewpoints. Many very famous philosophers have written books which are, have almost the same title. I mean, they, they are very large. I've chosen two here, but I could go on with, with a list. Uh, also, you'll see big differences between, say, Harvard, uh, Michael Sandel, and, and Stanford, the brass hats. Um, they have very different views, even so they start from exactly the same starting point, which is a kind of distrust of markets. But, you know, this is a very different approach. So the best-selling one, of course, is uh, Michael Sandel, and I'm sure a number of you have, have read the book, um, where he talks about what's wrong with markets, with the, idea, with the idea, idea that a number of goods should not co be co commoditized. Uh, so babies for adoption, surrogate marriage, sexuality, drugs, military service, votes, uh, organs for transplantation, so on. And same thing for friendship, admission to elite universities, to, to Geneva University, or Nobel Prizes, you should not be able to purchase them. Um, and then uh, genes, and I won't, I'm not going to tell you what happened, but, <laughs> but the, uh, our genes are our life forms to be patented. So, you know, broad-based distrust of markets. Um, now, when you look at each of those, you start asking questions, maybe they may be right. Now, they may be right, I agree, uh, but I don't like the gut feeling. Um, and I develop what's wrong with what's wrong, uh, in a sense, which is more postures, feelings of revulsion, are pretty unreliable source of physical inspiration. So, for a very long time, and still today in some countries, sex between people of the same sex or different races was thought of as being highly moral, disgusting. And this majority of people were imposing their views on minorities who actually didn't exert any externality on them, except that they didn't agree. So, moral assertions can override the freedom of others. And my view is in indignation is only a warning signal. So the possibility is that something might be wrong, but if you stop there, that's very bad. That's very bad because you say, my gut feeling is this, and therefore you should not be allowed to do that. And that's something I don't like. Um, I, I recognize, I'm, I feel indignant myself, so I, you know, I understand that there are issues with certain things, and therefore I think of that as being a warning signal, but no more than a warning signal. The second issue with what's wrong with what's wrong is that you cannot assume markets away. So those markets, whether you like them or not, they do exist. So think about you know, markets for organs, for transplantation, think about prostitution, those markets exist. I mean, you can shut your eyes, you can be the ostrich, but in the end they will still exist. So you really have to think about what you don't like and how to regulate them and prevent them, but you should not assume them away. And, you know, what's wrong with markets will be built on the identification of market failure, which is actually a central task of economics. And in that sense, I think that economics is a moral and philosophical science. So, the economy standard moral compass, if I can say so, is uh, market failures, but market failures are much broader than what we teach often in econ econ economics classes. So take externalities, for example. In externalities, we teach, you know, uh, carbon externalities. So we emit CO2, it's bad for the planet, blah, 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 and therefore we don't internalize as a consequence of our, of our actions on, on other, onto others. Same thing for vaccines, same thing for antibiotics, we tend to be selfish, blah, blah. Okay, but you know, more, this is much broader than that. So think about simple issue, you know, babies for adoption. So who wants to have a market where the highest bidder will get, um, you know, will buy the baby? I don't see any, but maybe you're, not, you're afraid. You like some, why not? The question, the question with that um, is that there is a missing party in the, in the deal, right? There is an anxiety on the baby, 
And the question is whether the highest bidder is also the one who is going to give the most love and will take the better, best care of, of the baby. You know, that's one thing. It's even more obvious with slavery. You know, in a slavery trade, there's, of course, a missing party with a slave, right? You know, that, that's kind of obvious. Uh, child labor is the same issue. Um, market for votes, of course, you know, if, if I set, sell my vote to Jean-Charles, that also means that uh, I'm exerting an anxiety on the rest of you because Jean-Charles will exercise the vote in some way. And because Jean-Charles Jean -Charles has deep pockets, he will buy lots of votes and he will be a dictator of Switzerland. So, you know, we, we have to be careful about that, um, of course. But it's even broader than that. So think about image anxiety. So there was an interesting case in France uh, 25 year, years ago where the Supreme Court had to decide on whether this really stupid, uh, sorry, I, I, I'm not politically correct, but this, this game of throwing little people uh, as far as you can in a nightclub uh, was legal. So that's an interesting case because, and by the way, there have been cases in the US and many other countries on that. That's an interesting case because the little person who was being thrown, it seems like it wasn't dangerous. I don't know, I've never attended those things, but there's a lot of padding and so on. So it seems it's not dangerous. So you, you see what game, you have seen some, some movies about that, but yeah, you, you try to throw, to throw that person as far as you can. In a nightclub, people are fun. <laughs> don't ask me why they're fun, but they're fun. That's, that's, uh, that's a story. And the interesting thing is that the little person actually objected to that. He said, this is my business, this is my labor. You are taking my job away from me. I have the right, I want to do that. The nightclub wants to hire me. Why can I do it? And that in the decision of the Supreme Court in France, uh, there was this idea that fine, this person wanted to do it and that's fine with us. The problem is with the image that you convey on other small little people and this is also often mentioned in the case of prostitution on the image that people have of women. Um, now, this is a difficult issue, right? But it's an image anxiety, so, so that's something which, which can be discussed. Um, imperfectly competitive markets, so, you know, again, you know, we are using economics about talking in, uh, about, you know, the GAFAs and their market power and the telecom company and whatnot. Um, they exercise their market power. That's why we need the antitrust authorities. We need regulation and the like. But of course, it's much broader. Um, so for example, people ob object to price gouging. So taking advantage of a hurricane to sell you the hotel room much more expensive uh, than, than usual. Contracts which are written under duress and so on, the abuse is a dominant position. But there are also things which have to do with information, so, which is, of course, another branch of, uh, of economics. Either incomplete information, so, for example, uh, people don't realize, for example, if you have a contract pregnancy, the bonding with a child, or if you have oxycontin, you know, an opioid, then you know, our addictivity. So you might think it's, it's kind of... Uh, of uh, asymmetric, inf incomplete information, but also asymmetric information is, uh, is also very important. Uh, you know, if I had paid Jean-Charles to be my friend, I would not know whether he's my friend, right? That means there's no way. You know, a friendship, you cannot buy it because by definition, if you start paying, you just don't know whether the person is your, is your friend. Um, same thing if you start paying for your diploma, I'm not talking about tuition, it's, slightly, it's a bit different here, yeah, but if you start paying for your diploma uh, without having the required grades, then of course nobody knows whether you, you are talented and you're hardworking and so on. So, you know, this is, you know, people say, oh, economists would like to, people to pay for, for the diploma, even the Nobel Prize, you know. Uh, and no, no, that's not true, that's not what economics says at all. You know, the entire body of, uh, of knowledge in economics goes in the opposite direction, so it's, it's kind of bizarre to actually have this uh, thing. An interesting thing that economists have been working a lot on in the last uh, two or three decades is internalities. So internalities is basically an externality. 
except that it's an anxiety from the short-term self to the long-term self. So the, it's basically the idea, uh, at least one, one, uh, one version of internality is that, is basically the idea is that uh, you don't stand for your own best interest. So, you know, I'm going to watch TV tonight and stuff, uh, being with friend or working. Uh, I'm going to drink too much tonight and stuff. <laughs> because, you know, that's my short-term self. It's, it's easier, it's more pleasant and something. Smoking is the, the issue, under-saving is the issue, and so on. But again, you know, that is something that you can apply uh, to a much broader set of issues. It's not only drugs or under-saving, but think about voluntary slavery. So we are all against slavery because slavery, of course, the person who becomes a slave is not part of the contract and would have said no, of course, to, to the contract. But what about voluntary slavery? That's a much more interesting example. So, you know, why don't you, why should not a court enforce the fact that I'm selling my labor to you for the rest of my life? You give me a, a big sum of money, I'm selling my labor. And, you know, it's not under the rest, it's just an agreement between you and me. Well, um, the issue is that, you know, if if I'm impatient and uh, I'm impulsive, I might want to have the money now, um, and then uh, it, might, it might be bad because later on I will regret it very badly. Um, I might want it actually for my children if I'm a poor person. Um, but you know, still, uh, still that might not be in my own best interest. And many people have said, you know, when they see people selling organs, their kidney for $300, they say, no, look, I mean, is that really what you want? There is another thing coming in, actually, in, the, in that picture. I will come back to this example. But, you know, the idea is that people really want the $300 now, but of course they will regret it later on. Um, so that's, that's an issue. Uh, doping in sport combines internalities and externality because, of course, if you, if you are a cyclist and you, you take drugs, uh, performance-enhancing drugs, you are going to... Uh, hurt yourself, but you know, not in the short term. In the short term, <laughs> I guess it's going to benefit you, but you, know, you are going to hurt yourself in the long run. But also there is an image externality onto the other cyclist. Um, inequality, okay, this is just uh, beyond the veil of ignorance. Uh, we would not want as much inequality, especially when there is little more of that. So, you know, you don't choose your genes, you, you may not choose your, your parents. I mean, I don't know many people who chose their parents. <laughs> Um, genders, uh, you know, and all those things. So you, you don't want to have an unequal society, especially on, on this kind of attribute, right? Because, you know, this is not something. Privacy is also an interesting thing. That's something that uh, personally I've gotten more and more involved in, um, in various aspects. But this is also something where regulation is needed very badly. And that's something that economists have worked less on, but it's very important nowadays. And there are various concerns about privacy. Uh, the fact that uh, platforms and governments have all your data, they know everything about you. So the first thing is basically the capture of behavioral surplus. Uh, the fact that uh, you know, the platform knows everything about you and can basically tailor a price to your conditions or if the platform notices that you don't have a clue about a topic or a product, basically sell you the lemon. And that's, that's of course, something we are, we are... And they know that from search, they know that from our emails, they know that from many other things. Uh, and that's, of course, a danger for markets. Uh, because if the platform capture our behavioral surplus, we're in trouble. And they can also use our impulsiveness on top of that. Uh, and they do. Um, they may destroy insurance. So if you are in a country where insurance is private and there is no prohibition of discrimination on the basis of the health status, then, um, of course, through the, through the emails, through, through various other things, they will know, even pictures, they will know whether you are likely to be in a good health or bad health, and then they will discriminate, and of course, the uh, health insurance. Uh, but I could, uh, I could apply that to other things. Um, data in the, on the web, of course, violate our, our right to oblivion, which is a very fundamental right, which is captured in many legal frameworks and also in many religions. The fact that if you commit a misdeed, 
you pay for it. But once you have paid for it, you start with a clean slate, which of course is, is not doable if you, if you actually, uh, your data are staying on the web. Divisive issue is something I'm, I'm working on, the fact that uh, there are things which are consensual, I mean, and things which are divisive. So consensual, I think most of us will say committing a pri crime is not nice. Emitting CO2 is not nice. We may put more or less weight on that, but you know, by and large, we think that's, that's, it, that's not good. But there are other issues on which we are divided, like politics, religion, sexuality, abortion, vaccines, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So, you know, that's, that creates other issues, uh, and you know, I'm working on the issue of safe space. And finally, there's the issue, the issue of social scoring and the use of social scoring both by platform but also by governments, which is going to come more and more and can be a threat to, uh, to our democracies and, and to our privacy. Um, now, government failures. Okay, so I stayed with Adam Smith and Pigou maybe, where basically there's market, markets are efficient, but they also have market failures, there are many market failures. The state is there. It's, a, it's, it's really the, the definition of capitalism in a sense. You, you create, you have a state which is going to correct the market failures, but you're going to leave the market operating. The problem, as we see in many, in many domains, is the governments fail as often as market fail. Uh, governments are captured by lobbies, cronism, they pander to the electorate because they want to be elected, they are very short termists. And you see that with, with climate change. Climate change is one of the many time bombs. In climate change, you don't do anything for a year or two. Doesn't matter. But a year or two, plus a year, plus a year, plus a year, that we have now three decades of inaction. If you think about public finances, if you think about education in some countries, if you think about yeah, many other things, um, you are going to end up with uh, time bombs all over the place. So those are issues which, for which the political life is not quite appropriate. And then there are jurisdictional aspects. So, you know, if there is child labor in another country or pollution in other countries, you know, unless you invade the country, it's kind of pretty hard to avoid. And there are things you can do. So, but you know, um, and. What is a modern state? I mean, you can make the state a bit better by, you know, emphasizing, emphasizing the necessity of being a regulator. So a good prudential regulation of banks, a carbon price, green R&D, whatever, try to correct the, all the market failures I, I talk about. An enabler through the legal framework, through the funding of uh, high risk, high, high reward projects. Managerial state, I'm more suspicious of that because, of course, uh, uh, the state is not a very good employer and a, not a very efficient, uh, not a very efficient uh, industry player in general. Now, under COVID-19, um, you know, we, there's been a lot of externalities. Actually, if you think about social distancing, contract tracing, uh, testing, vaccines, it's full of anxieties, and of course we need, we need to solve that. Um, there was a lot of short-termism. What's striking it was to me was a lack of preparation, uh, lack of preparation of governments, but also lack of preparation of economists and social scientists, because it was not a surprise. Um, sure, there are, there was a coronavirus. That's the first time it's so so bad. But they, they, they could, we knew there could be such things, but we also know that the permafrost is melting, so it's going to release bacteria and viruses, uh, which we don't know how to deal with. We know that there is antibiotic resistance, so we are missing antibiotics. So in the two or three decades coming, it's going to be very dangerous if we don't develop anti new antibiotics. Um, I'm not talking about biological warfare. Um, and somehow it's not frequent enough that people, that the state uh, 
you know, says it's a priority. It's not only mask which I'm missing, but it's, it's the entire apparatus. So think about the pandemic pass, how long it took actually to impose the idea of a pandemic pass. I remember when we discussed that a year ago, lots of people were incredibly hostile to pandemic pass. And today we are in this room together, thanks to two things. First, the scientists, I'm incredibly grateful to scientists, to be honest, I mean, it's, it's amazing. They are, you know, we, we avoid 10 years of lockdown, you know, uh, lockdown on and off. Um, I'm incre I don't even want to talk about the public finances, but they are, I'm incredibly grateful to the scientists, you know. And then, you know, the past, which also helps, uh, which is a small innovation, of course, but it's kind of obvious thing to do. And that's something that we were not prepared. So it actually required a lot of skill. I mean, I saw that in France, actually, to introduce a pass at the right moment. That in France worked out pretty well, but uh, it, was, it was pretty hard. And we saw, of course, just like in other areas, um, natural interest being paramount. So the last thing I would like to do, but I'm going to spend some time on that, uh, is what's wrong with our policy recommendation? Of course they are right. Of course they are right, but you know, the, the issue is that, and you know, I just finished a report with Olivier Blanchard and the Commission of uh, 24 Economists, and one of the things, you know, some of the recommendations we make in the report are not new. Carbon price, come on. Yeah, <laughs> this is something that economists have been talking for a century, and, uh, and you know, they all talk about it and so on, and, and still it's not adopted. So what's wrong? What are the perceptions? Um, and how can we improve this? So what I'm calling for is really a new research agenda for public economics. Because individual morality and public policies are shaped in part by cognitive biases. And that's what I would like to investigate a little bit. I don't have the answer, but I would like to put that into, into your brains so that you, you start thinking about it. And that's going to be part of our case in fields like economics or medicine or biology or climate change or evolution theory, which are very close to what people know about and, what, you know, and to policy in general. So the first thing uh, I develop is, that I develop in a book in part, uh, is motivated beliefs. The fact that we believe what we want to believe. Everybody, I mean, I'm including myself. Um, you know, there are things we want to believe. Um, you, may have seen, <laughs> you may have seen the AGFI uh, uh, title uh, today, uh, uh, but you know, the fact that uh, I'm kind of interested in understanding why people talk or the politicians talk all the time about the green growth and green jobs and happy climate transition. Why do they do that? Well, because they are clever. And why are they clever? Because we have a demand for rosy beliefs. We don't want to believe that actually fighting climate change is going to cost us anything. Okay, so if you say, look, we can have our cake and eat it too. Uh, we can grow and have many jobs creation be, and be richer at the same time. This is wonderful. Except that, why is that for three decades, 200 countries all have chosen the opposite track, not to do anything? Um, so you, you have to think about that. And the reason is that the electorate actually has a demand for rosy beliefs. We want to, just like we want, don't want to think about our own death or the death of, of loved people, uh, fortunately we don't think about it all day. Um, we don't want to think that about the consequences of climate change and the fact that we have to pay and reduce our standard of living to actually save the planet. But that's dangerous because, you know, and even the green job, I mean, if just, I don't want to go into the detail, we could have a long discussion about that, but, you know, sure, if you invest, you're going to create green jobs. You're also going to destroy jobs in coal mines, right? Which, they should be destroyed, unfortunately. But, you know, the money you spend, you could also use that in education, create jobs in education or in hospitals. So, you know, the argument itself doesn't carry any weight, even at a simplistic level. So why is that it's so popular? 
That's because there is a demand, and there are demand for, um, and that's more general than that. So we don't like to think of our society as being unequal. So there are things we don't want to see. And part of the issue with organ sales and prostitution is that it shows even more how unequal our society is. You know, people sell their kidney for $300. They prostitute themselves. You know, that says something about our society. And, you know, sometimes uh, the response is, it's not the right one. You just move the prostitution to another neighborhood so that you don't see it anymore. Um, we don't want to see that sometimes our society is violent. There is this bizarre case in France. Uh, you may know that uh, the... Um, Death penalty in France was abolished uh, in the first year of Mitran's mandate, uh, first mandate, in 1981. But public execution were stopped in 1939. So they were all that time in between in which executions were still there, but they were in private. Now, what happened in 1939? Something very, very embarrassing for the French. So there was an execution, and it was at 5 a.m. And at 5 a.m., people brought their children to see the execution, and they rejoiced. And there were pictures of that and so on, which is a very bad, uh, a very bad uh, view on society. I mean, if you see that, you start thinking that you live in a very violent society. And that's not necessarily the society you live in. So, again, you try to get rid of the prime by making it private in a prison as opposed to making it public. Because that's very offensive to the view we have of society. We don't want to leave this kind of society. But there, that has an implication for economists. Because I would say economists, and maybe it's a bit defensive here, but economists are the bearers of bad news. What do they say very often? You know, many of us in this room have worked on limits to incentives. So, you know, there are hundreds of reasons why we want to have incentives which are not always high powered. You know, it might be because performance is not easy to measure. Short term versus long term, team theory, blah, blah, blah. It may be capture, uh, it may be uh, adverse selection, there may be other, many other issues, uh, repeated situation. So, Lots of economists have worked on the limit of incentive, but by and large, they're still saying incentives work. And you know, when you have 26 economists together, and they all say you need a carbon price which is much higher than now, um, then they still say you need incentives. And it's not only your commission. I mean, that's much more general than that. Um, but of course, we need incentives. It's bad news about society, because we would like to live in, so in a society which is much nicer, where people will promote a common good without being paid for it. You will expect people to, to do the right thing. And you, know, you come here and you say, no, no, no. You need incentive, otherwise you, you are not going to solve the issue. Another telltale uh, sign of that is a way lawyers, I, mean, I don't know if there are legal scholars in the room, but lawyers tend to talk about incentives. So, for example, you know, we, when we talk about debt repayment or when we talk about the protection of intellectual property, we say, you know, if you want to have funding or if you want to have innovation, you need actually to have contract enforcement where the people who bring the money are going to, um, uh, to be repaid, where the innovator will be rewarded for that. Now, that's not what the lawyers say. They say it's fair. You know, it's, it's a question of fairness. It, for debt repayment, it's even a moral obligation of repaying one's debt. Uh, so, basically, they have understood that you have to reframe the policy debate in terms of equity and fairness as opposed to efficiency and incentives, which is what economists do. Um, at the same time, I recognize that the economist can be sometimes a destroyer of social norms. Because when we say you need incentives to fight climate change, for example, we also say, well, society is not as good as you would wish. You know, people just don't reduce their carbon emission by themselves as you would like them to do. 
And you know, there have been 30 years of exhortation and almost no impact. Um, but the point is that in those dimensions in which you cannot control, so you cannot provide incentives, then you may also destroy, so when there is no police or no, no tax collector or something like that, you may actually destroy uh, some, uh, some uh, social norms. So there is this danger that actually we, by saying society is not as nice as we think, uh, we actually might uh, actually create bad behavior in those areas because social norm is, is basically strategic complementarity and you create uh, bad behaviors in those areas that you cannot control through incentives. Um, first impression is a, another issue that you have to confront when designing policy, which is that uh, very often when you have a public policy, people focus on the direct effect, the obvious effect. But then there are secondary effects, like general equilibrium effects. So in, in carbon, uh, carbon issues, there are many leakage problems. That's actually why we want to have a carbon tax adjustment uh, at the border uh, in order to be able to have high carbon prices without having offshoring. But that's more general than that. So people who are in favor of rent control, um, if you think about it, it's a nice thing because you basically redistribute money from rich households to who own the place and poor households. So on paper, it's a nice thing, except that of course, there are the incentive effects that creates, and at some point, of course, you, know, you don't have uh, any supply of housing, and whatever remains is completely degraded. Um, same thing with employment protection, like in France, where you have excessive un un employment protection, with the outcome, of course, that you create only short-term uh, uh, so short jobs. Um, and actually, you, you create actually a lot of inequality uh, with the intent of actually protecting workers. That's, you know, th so the, the jargon effects are something that people often don't think about, and that's, that's an issue. Um, now, the economists, maybe again it's a bit defensive here, but the economists view themselves as a protector of the invisible victim. So the invisible victim is the young person who will try to get a house, uh, an apartment, or is trying to get a job and doesn't get one. Um, but of course, we are also viewed as indifferent to the suffering of the visible victim. Uh, the, you know, the, there is no rent control, so you have to pay decently high rent, or um, you may be laid off as a, as a worker, and so on. So that's, that's, really, uh, that's really an issue. Refusal to contemplate ethical dilemmas. Um, so, something that people dislike. Actually, with COVID, there was a little bit of a progress on that. They really dislike um, contemplating the dilemmas. What is the value of life? Are you upset if I ask the question, what is the value of life? I'm sure many of you may, must be upset. Life is priceless, right? It's not priceless at all. Every director of an hospital uh, puts a value on life every day. You yourself, when you decide to take a trip with your children, you put a value on, li on the life of your children. Of course, because you increase the probability of accident and you put a value on life. We all put a value on life every day, but we don't want to admit it because it's unbearable. It's unbearable and you know, that creates problem, but that of course has an impact. I thought you know, with the COVID, you know, there were countries like Italy or France where there were not enough ventilators and then we had to have this debate, which is, you know, do you value this life more than this life? Yeah, and it's difficult. It, it hurts us actually to, to think about it, but we have to do it. There is no choice. But that's broader than that. A world of legal damages, automobile standards, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's very... And that, the, the ultimate uh, ethical issue um, is a trolley dilemma which has been worked on by philosophers for decades now. So a typical tro trolley dilemma is that you have the choice between killing one person in order to save five other people. Um, so, but if you ask a doctor, 
Are you willing to kill this healthy person, take the organs, and save five people who actually are, going, are just about to die? I don't think any doctor would say one against five. I'm going to kill that person. Of course, you could think of abuses. Forget about the abuses, okay? But even the very thought that you will kill someone to save five people um, will be very upsetting for someone who has been on the horse promising to save life. But of course, that, that doctor is killing the five people and by doing that. So, so it's very difficult to, to think about it. But it's coming now. It's coming now. So in a couple of years, hopefully, we'll have self-driving cars, autonomous cars. But you, you have situations in which basically you, you have to decide between killing the driver by throwing a, yourself against a, a wall or, or whatever in order to save five pedestrians. Okay? Now, right now we don't contemplate it straight off. It happens in a fraction of, of a second um, and it's not being discussed. But it's going to be the software which is going to decide whether to kill the driver and, um, and then actually save, or save five pedestrians. So actually, among the, the many experiments uh, done by my colleague uh, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Toulouse, a psychologist of also Benfort and his co-authors, uh, they have looked at attitudes toward that. And interestingly, actually, most people say, you know, I want to to save the five people, I want to kill the driver. And that makes sense behind the veil of ignorance because you have five times probability of being the pedestrian as, a, as opposed to the driver, unless you, know, you, you love driving, but behind the veil of ignorance, you don't yet know whether you love driving. So you have five more times, uh, as much time to, to be among the pedestrian. Um, except that when you ask them afterwards, do you want the government to regulate your car, the software of your car? They say, oh, no, no, I don't want, I don't want the government to regulate the software of my car. Um, meaning that I, 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 what I said actually is not the truth. I, I, I don't want to be sacrificed for the five pedestrians. Um, so it tells you we have some progress to make on that dimension. Uh, the poor comprehension of statistics is also something well documented. I don't have to go through that. Um, divisive issues, microaggressions. So I could go on and on, but I think uh, Marcus is going to stop me and, and take the microphone. So to avoid any violence, I'm going to continue uh, right now. What do we do? So give me a couple, couple of minutes. Um, the, um, one of the things we have to do is to win the narrative contest. And that's not something that economists are at ease with, but we need to actually work on that. Um, for one thing, by the way, I talk about statistics. Something which is not well understood by most people is statistics, even the brightest people. And the experiments of Kahneman and Tversky on Harvard Medical School students is actually quite telling. And those are very, very bright people. Statistics, people just understand, and they don't care. You know, if you want, people to wear their safety belt. I still remember when you don't show the statistic of the number of life it saves. You show someone being uh, you know, thrown against the, the windshield and you know, some very gory details. That, that's much more efficient. And actually, it's not new. Marcel Proust has this wonderful citation. I translated it from French. I don't know what the, in English it is. But the facts do not penetrate the world our beliefs live in. That's actually a very interesting citation because that's very true. Uh, the facts is not something that works in policy, unfortunately, because we as economists, our bread and butter is about facts. Actually, many social scientists too. Uh, but it's very ineffective in policy making, unfortunately. Um, and actually, when you correct the facts, when you have fake news and the like, you correct the facts, there are experiments which show actually it doesn't have much effect. That's sad. That's very sad. So. Uh, I put two, uh, two pictures here to, to get something uh, more fun. Of course, Marcel Proust and the recent uh, book by Steven Pinker, uh, who has, uh, actually is very much arguing in favor of facts and the like uh, in a very interesting way. But uh, 
um, that doesn't work. So there are many anti-common good uh, narratives, and how do we debunk them? By the way, there are also many pro-common good narratives. So think about the Kantian formula of the universal law. Just imagine when you take a decision that everybody else is going to do the same, just to try to picture what consequences it will have. Uh, that's a good narrative favoring the common good. A fairy tale, you know, the movies, Hollywood movies. You know, the good, the good guy is actually losing out, but you know, at the end he's going to win. So it's really a story about, about you know, a world you want to live in. And you know, if you do good, then you'll be the winner at the end. And we don't like movies which do not end nicely, right? They always kind of uh, uh, create some anxiety, of course. And of course, all kinds of stories we read to our children, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so maybe we economists, we should start with a narrative, even so this narrative is not very scientific, and actually try then to display the facts, because we still need the facts in the end. But you know, in terms of proceeding, you're having some kind of analogy and some narrative and so on, so that people get used to it. Because the populists who spread all the fake news, they're extremely, extremely good at doing that. They're, they're incredibly good at finding the narratives. And we have to do the same, except that we'll have the facts too. Um, now, what tricks do narratives use? Okay, I already mentioned motivated beliefs, you know. Hope for a bright future, somebody else will pay. Ecology should not be punitive, come on. You know, a subsidy is a tax. So, you know, just that doesn't make sense. Perspective taking. We all know that if you show the, the picture and the story of, of a kid who migrates to Europe, for example, it's much more powerful than any fact. It doesn't mean anything by itself, by the way. That only the fact counts. But you know, when you see the, story, the, the picture and the story of this child, you are moved. And that may actually be much more efficient than a fact, at least to start with. And you know, the confusion between correlation and causality. Of course, we all know that you shouldn't go to the hospital when you are sick, because the probability of, of dying in an hospital is much larger than the probability of dying at home. Uh, but you know, this is typical uh, economics 101 uh, course. But you know, it's, it's used by politicians quite a lot. You know, correlation becomes a causality or implies a causality. Um, and something which is very important that is less discussed is the fact that people lose, use, they are looking for excuses for bad behavior. And sometimes, you know, the excuses um, are about vaccines, uh, for example, they are hoax for, to make ph pharmaceutical companies rich. I mean, we have heard lots of those things. Um, sometimes they are less flimsy, but they're also dangerous. So the replacement excuse is a standard excuse that if I don't do it, somebody else will. So I can sell this weapon to a dictator, I can work in a concentration camp, I can, uh, I, I can, uh, do, I can sell opioids because another doctor will prescribe the opioid and so on and so forth. This is a standard thing. But let me talk a little bit about excuses. There is a uh, huge literature now are in economics about more wiggle room. Um, this, this story, I started with a paper which is very, very simple. Some of you may know it. You start from a dictator game. A dictator game is basically you choose between being generous and being selfish. So here, the dictator is going to choose, you know, you as a subject, you choose between taking six euros for yourself and one for the other person, you don't know the other person, but you basically can take six euros for yourself and you, 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 uh, you give one to the other, or you can choose five for each. Okay, so B is a generous, generous policy and A is a selfish policy. Um, that has been done thousands of times. Uh, people don't always choose the profit maximizing thing. So for example, the you know, three quarters in the experiment will choose Okay, fine. This is well established. You can explain that people internalize a, li a little bit the welfare of other people, so they are willing to, to, uh, to pay one in order to increase the, the, the payoff of the other by four. Now, in, in reality, it's a bit less than that, but you know, by and large, we all care a little bit about others. 
Okay. Now, the interesting thing is the modification of this gamma. Um, it's a very slight variation. So imagine there are two states of nature, each has probability 50%. And in state of nature one, the, the dilemma is the same as before. You can be generous or you can be selfish. So A is a selfish action or generous. In state of nature two, it's a no-brainer. It's a complete no-brainer. Uh, choosing A, oof, there's been a prime with a, with a PowerPoint, sorry about that. But you know, choosing A, is going to, to give much more payoff to both than choosing B, okay? So instead of nature two, you choose A, regardless of your preferences, unless you are really a nasty person. Um, and instead of nature A, we saw that actually uh, one, I'm sorry, actually three quarters will choose B, the general action. So in that experiment, which has been replicated in, in more real life context, context uh, several times, um, you ask the subject, do you want to know the state of nature? You click on this button on the computer and you will know for free, it's for free, whether you are in state of nature one or in state of nature two. Um, we have general CRMs in economics saying, if you have more information, you are a better decision maker. And of course, here, if you want to be generous instead of nature one, and selfish and generous at the same time instead of nature two, you would like to know. Because in one case, you are going to choose B, in the other case, you are going to choose A, you like to know the state of nature. And lo and beyond, what's going to happen? What will you do? Uh, you're not going to tell me. <laughs> not in public. But those were not in public, they were. So, it's, they were ex all those experiments is self-signaling. So you are trying to think of yourself <laughs> as a good person. Nobody knows what you have chosen. And the answer is that many people actually choose not to know. Contrary to the logic of economics, they don't want to know. Why? Guess what they do when they don't know? They choose A. They choose A because they have the excuse that they may not be selfish because it's true that instead of nature two, they are not selfish. But of course, the entire behavior is selfish. So it's very interesting that when you don't have state of nature two, people are kind of generous. But if you give them any small flimsy excuse, then they, they revert to, to selfish behavior. And this is much broader than that. So you know, there are experiments in which you delegate a decision which is not very nice, like laying off a worker to somebody else. And that fascinating experiment, and how you choose that person you are delegating to is absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Um, avoiding the ask, you know, if I come to your, if you come to my house, it's, it's really like this, you, you tell me tomorrow I'll, I'll be working for the Red Cross, I will come to your, ha to your house in order to ask you for money. Well, chances are that I will try to make sure that not here when you, when you come by, right? Of course, I won't, you know, I won't have refused the ask. Um, and there are also very interesting things on the replacement issues where I've been doing a fair amount of work with, with Matthias de Wettrepo. Um, so, long-term strategy, we have to instill respect for science, discrete relativism and, uh, and post-truth. Um, and there, are, there is a lot of work to do. So we are in the, in the country very close to Geneva, you have a country of Descartes and Pasteur and others. And you know, three quarters of the French believe homeopathy is, is efficient and is still reimbursed. Um, there's been a big anti-vax movement, not, not as big as I would expect it. There were lots of people actually who were not fully anti-vax and actually got vaccinated, but you, you also get lots of messages on 5Gs and GMOs and so on. You know, I don't care whether you are for or against that, but I just say, let's have a scientific debate, which we just don't have. Um, but he, he, and this link also with populism. So um, if you think, you know, here are some quotes, you know, everybody talks about Brexit and, and uh, Lord, uh, Lord uh, Chancellor Gove, you know, and think people of this country have, have had enough of experts. Thank you for the experts. Uh, but it's not specific to the UK, so just imagine you were in the 1790s in France or in England, 
You have Lavoisier, who is a famous uh, chemist, of course, who wanted to do the last experiment before, be, you know, uh, before dying, and he was refused. And the president of the Revolutionary Court, you know, he was just trying to have a last experiment to confirm our theory. His theory, so, you know, how can you refuse that? And he was very, he was very famous and a very productive scientist. And then, he, you know, the Republic doesn't need scientists. I, I love that one. Uh, the, the one of Edmund Burke, which is the father of conservatism in, in the UK, is actually fantastic as well. The age of chivalry is gone. That of sophister, economists, and calculators has succeeded, and the glory of Europe is extinguished forever. We don't have those thinkers anymore, unfortunately. I mean, they are great, right? They are, they are a lot of fun. Uh, but of course, we know that we are not saints. We are economists, we are social scientists, we are scientists in general. We have conflicts of interest. They may come from money. They can come from a willingness to have access to data. Uh, we know we may be influenced by the private sector. We may be influenced by, by, the, by the government and so on. We have a, a temptation. We have temptation to be public intellectuals. Now, there is nothing wrong per se, in being a public intellectual, but you built an audience. And the audience, you may be worried about disappointing this audience later on. And that makes, makes you actually say things that you will not be saying in a seminar room. And that's, that's an issue. And the other issue is that even if you are very honest with yourself, you are discredited. Because you may be a left-wing person, viewed as a left-wing person or right-wing person, and people will think you are saying that not because it's your science, but because you have a political agenda. And that's an issue, so it's not easy. Um, you know, we don't want to be categorized. Um, the message becomes more important than the content of the message uh, reasoning. Um, and to, so we have to get our act together, of course, but we, we also need education. So we need to teach at school you know, I was saying correlation versus causality. You don't have to make that boring. You really have to, you can explain to kids the difference between correlation and causality. Just do you know, a simple randomized experiment. You take Pasteur. You know, what he did, he just had a control group and a treatment group. It's very simple to understand. You can teach that to 10 year old and it's not being done. And of course, we also have to participate in the, the public debate. So let me conclude. Uh, Marcus is a very civilized person. He's, he hasn't turned violent yet. Uh, the pre-COVID opportunity and the challenge are still there. So there are amazing opportunities, but you know, there are all those time bombs that I was discussing earlier. Uh, global warming, the future of labor due to AI, international cooperation, inequality, regulation, debt, uh, and you name it. I mean, there are many others. And you know, some questions. What happens to you when you get the Nobel Prize is that people think you have the answer to everything, which is totally wrong. Even simple question like, do you think that COVID actually is going to be a catalyst for change? People would have understood we are fragile and therefore we are going to protect our planet. Or is that going to be an eco chamber of our weaknesses? And the answer is, I don't have a clue. Uh, if, if you had me for a guess, I would say nothing has changed. When I see the change in behavior, it's absolutely minimal after COVID. But I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but what is sure is that we need to anticipate more and use economics and social e science analysis and confront the ethical dilemma. Think about the way we address to public policy too. And again, facts is wonderful. This is the most important thing, but they don't fly. So we need to do better with that. And then we have to think about what kind of society we would like to live in beyond the veil of ignorance and that the common good. So let me thank you so much again for the big honor of giving the Solari Lecture. I'm very pleased to be here today and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for questions, so who wants to start? Yes, Hugo? Uh, give you the mic. 
Thank you for the lecture. So one question about something you mentioned towards the end, it's the role of education, you know, the level of high school or even before. So I have a daughter in high school and they say that she spends a lot of time doing chemistry and biology and that's great. But she spends very little time to learn how to be a citizen, to you know, study maybe a simplified version of your book. And, uh, and I think that's something that's really missing because then these people are not well equipped to do this on the one hand. On the other hand, I'm afraid that if uh, you know, they were taught how to be a citizen, there is the risk of indoctrination, right? So that's just want to ask you what you think about that. Okay, uh, that's why I'm going to see if uh, Jean-Charles is a real friend. <coughs> He's going to help me with tough questions. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, that's... Okay, so, um, yeah, you go, I mean, the, it's very, I mean, I, I completely agree with what you said, and, you know, in the end, I think it's more productive, actually, to transform ourselves into people who understand the, um, you know, the, the public debate. I'm struck by the fact that, um, you know, I hear things, you know, on TV and radio and in newspaper, which makes absolutely no sense, okay? But then the journalist doesn't correct it. And yeah, that, that really upsets me. Um, and Joyce is part of the elite, right? It's already someone that is edu educated usually. Of course, there are many exceptions, but yeah, by and large, to be a good citizen, we, if we want to have good public policy, we need to have citizens who understand the, the stakes. And they must understand you know, the economics behind it in particular. They must understand the science which is behind it, if you want to understand medicine or other things. So, you know, to transform people in good citizens in some of, sure, I mean, we, you could have other things. You could, you could try to teach them to behave nicely, but, you know, it's, it's different. And, and the way you do it might turn into inter indoctrination. But, you know, in the end, if you teach them how to think about an argument and, you know, debunk all the fake news and and try to have respect for science and facts, I think it will change already a huge amount in the debate, right? It's not easy to do, but... Thank you very much for this very stimulating presentation. I had a short question on the, uh, the cognitive bias that you were talking about. Uh, so we want to believe what we believe what we want to believe. So. You said use economic social sciences, but in particular, I'm thinking maybe the psychology has a big role to play in terms of what is a good narrative to be able to convince people and to, as you said, you know, uh, to, to believe more believe uh, facts rather than and science rather than uh, false narratives or fake news. So, what is is it going to be the the, the future of um, psychology? Is it going to be the is going to be the major discipline which is going to contribute to this uh, having the good narrative. I mean, you, you are right. I mean, the, actually, the, the economists have picked up on narratives relatively recently compared to other social sciences. Uh, and my view is that because economists are more often confronted with public policy, they also have to work with psychologists and other social scientists, actually, to try to understand how you can actually create the right narratives. You know, again, you know, you might, yeah, you might think it's not the right thing because in the end, we are scientists. We, narratives should have no role. But the point is that narratives actually play a big role in public policy, a huge role. And if we don't counter on the narrative side, at least for people to listen to us, it's not going to fly. So we can talk about the carbon price, we can talk about equality of chances, we can talk about anything about migration. We won't, nobody will listen to us. And that's, that, I mean, sure, there are some clever politicians who will listen, but they won't act on it because the population won't follow them. So we need actually to actually catch the attention of people and then, then only then, actually try to present facts. And because then you have, you have caught their attention and they, are, they may be willing to listen. If it's pure statistic, I mean, there are now lots of evidence, you know, just, they don't listen. 
Um, hello, thank you very much for the lecture, Professor Tyrol, and also for, for your immense work. I read some of your papers and um, I've been always inspired. Thank you very much for that. And I have um, two questions. Um, the first is about the common good. I think when you speak about um, this topic, you assume that there is a common good and that it can be discover discovered. Um, and I think this is a very optimistic uh, way of looking at things. And I wonder uh, what role optimism plays and should play in our public life and in our um, intellectual struggles, uh, in our future intellectual struggles that you have on your, um, on your last uh, slide. And since we are in Geneva, which is the city of multilateralism, um, you mentioned that uh, multilateralism is in decline. Uh, however, with the recent uh, global tax deal and discussions about a global health treaty, um, things don't look so, um, so dark. So, um, yes, I wonder how you see uh, uh, multilateralism in relation also to, to common good. Uh, and whose common good is it? Is it mine, my families? Is it human, humankind? Um, yes, and thank you. Um, well, thank you, and let me start, yeah, sometimes there are good news. <laughs> so, uh, sure, the, you know, people criticize the uh, corporate tax agreement for being too small, blah, blah, blah. But in the end, it's still a big progress. Just the fact that there is some willingness to have some minimum tax and start on it, you know, I think uh, that makes me feel a little bit better because after 10 years of uh, decline in multilateralism, you see some of that going. You don't see it for climate change yet. I mean, you still see lots of vague pledges being made in the COPs, but not, not something substantial. So, um, so that, that's something which, 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 is, uh, which is good news. Now, the common good, um, there are, yes, I'm, I'm a bit too optimistic about that. So, uh, for several reasons. The first is that it's difficult for people to put themselves behind the very ignorance, including myself. You know, it's hard to imagine a different world uh, than mine, and, and that's, that's always difficult. Then it doesn't solve all the issues. So I, I put some of the conclusions that come from the veil of ignorance, but there are others, you know, how much, you know, in an optimal tax system, for example, you always have a trade-off between efficiency and redistribution. Now, where you put it is still a choice, you know, do you want a slightly poorer society, but more equal society? I mean, if you do things right, so there is a real trade-off, you know, where do you stop? And that's something difficult actually to decide, you know, because there's a value judgment there, and, and there, there I don't have an answer. And then there is a final thing is, Whose common good is this? So, you discuss the difference between Gesellschaft and Gemeinschaft by and large. You know. And you know, what is the circle? Is that my family, my friends, my countrymen? Uh, who is that? The common good. And we could discuss that at length. So, is that mankind? Does it include people who will be born in 100 years from now? Uh, does it include animals? And Peter Singer will tell you that includes animals, and so on. So, where where do you stop? Where is your circle? Or do you put different weights depending on how close they are to yours? So that's something actually we don't have an answer to, because you know, in principle, at least you know you should consider something beyond your friends and family and beyond your country fellows, because you you might be born in a different country and and so on. Um, but at the same time, we know that decisions are taken at the level of the family, at the level of, of the firm, at the level of the country. So there is something natural, actually, in standing for the interests of, of the family, of, et cetera. So that's also why we put, I mean, we have very different attitudes, you know, for, you know, for the beggar in the street, in our street, and vis-a-vis -vis people dying uh, in Africa. And part of it is salience, of course, because we see the beggar, we don't see the children who are dying. But also, um, you know, the national interest is also at the center of policy making. And, you know, if you are in Texas and you are asked actually to contribute to the Green Fund so that India will actually have a decent carbon price, um, and you are a Texas taxpayer, chances are 
you'll be wrong, but you know, chances are that you will say, no, I'm not going to pay for foreigners far away from Texas. Uh, and that, that you see that the common good there is not, is not represented. But, but there's also something to be said in favor of, uh, you know, after all, the government is, is supposed to stand for the interests of, of its citizens. And that's a way, you know, through the election, electoral power program. So there, there is actually a very difficult thing, and those are the kind of things we think about. So I presented the common good as something totally obvious. It's a little bit, I agree with you, it's a little bit optimistic. You need to actually think in, in broader terms. Um, but there we get also in, into philosophy. But as I say, economics is a moral and philosophical science, so I don't want to escape the debate. Thank you, Professor. Uh, as you mentioned, the, uh, you mentioned the value of people's life, and this seems to be uh, very important recently. We see that COVID has caused a huge amount of deaths, and but we like when we go back to see that at the very beginning stage of this pandemic, many countries, many governments are um, very much reluctant to close down the economy, uh, and some of them, like United Kingdom and the Netherlands. Like even announced they have to use herd immunity as a policy to counting the corona. Does that mean, it seems like they are uh, more willing, they are like, uh, more deaths it seems more ac acceptable to them than the cl collapse of economy. Does this mean from the view of national regulator, uh, people's life is not that important as, as we usually thought? I think the image of uh, people dying in hospitals were very salient. And the invisible victims of the policies, you know, the fact that there is a huge uh, deficit, for example, and a, a lockdown, um, is much less visible because uh, it's, it's delayed and there are invisible victims. Um, and you know, I'm not saying it's wrong. You might say, you know, maybe we were right in having a lockdown, especially we didn't have masks at the time and so on. But you know, in the end, um, I think, at least in my home country, there was very little debate about the cost of doing all that. And you know, the price of life, you know, because France does a lot of other choices and you know, the price of life in France is like 3 million euros, whatever it is. You could debate, but you know, when you make hospital choices or so, things like that. But how much did a life save cost during COVID? It's, it's not those numbers either. So, you know, you have to ask yourself, and by the way, we had a, you know, Macron did a nice thing to have, a, that was done in other countries as well, to have a committee of scientists. And the scientists would come in to explain the science and gave their opinion and saying when they don't know. And that was a very good thing. But there was not a single economist in the team. Uh, even so, we were spending huge amount of money. So it's kind of strange. So the, the debate actually turned around lives, which is normal. I mean, if you're a doctor, that's what, what your, your job is about. You have to, to save lives. But then, you know, just having doctors, uh, mainly doctors in the, in the team, means that, of course, all the dimensions were neglected. And it, I would have liked to have more debate on, on this. Uh, which, of course, we had to save life. Of course, we, we had to do those things. But, but you know, it's, um, the rationality of, of policy is not only in France, but in every country, sometimes it's very bizarre, which is, you know, people will spend a huge amount of money to save a life, a huge amount of money to save a life during lockdown and so on. At the same time, they are very reluctant to impose a pass. Um, and you know, or to force all people to be vaccinated, and you know, you see, uh, come on, I mean, you're spending all that money, and you know, very simple thing and very cheap things. Your know, vaccine is is two euro fifty, right? Come on, you are not willing to do that to save a life, and then uh, you have to think a little bit more. But of course, the politicians react to the population, and the population may not get that in those terms. And if you don't talk about the value of life, whatever it is, I don't care if it's 3 million, 10 million, or whatever. If you don't talk about the value of life, you won't never get, get anywhere. And you'll keep the choices being made secretly by hospital directors, by uh, car builders, by whatever, by, by civil servants. 
It's, it's going to be done totally in secret. Um, thank you for the great presentation. Um, about um, the way governments deal uh, um, with population during the COVID crisis, there was a lot of heterodox experimentation with how to deal and protect uh, the citizens for the, and the country, etc., for the common good. Um, do you have any aspiration on how uh, governments will be inspired with some of the policies that they implemented and some of the methods with relation to green future and green energy and climate change? in relation to protecting the common good, with some of maybe um, limiting, uh, right limiting um, methods but might be implemented uh, with green energy and policy. So for, for green policies, I refer you to the report I've written with Olivier Blanchard and one third of the report was actually about climate change, not about the environment as a well, whole, but at least uh, climate change. And there we, we say, you know, you, you need a holistic policy, basically. So just having a carbon tax, we are fully in favor of a carbon tax, or carbon price, I should say, more than a carbon tax, is fine. But you also need a lot of R&D because we are way behind, and you're at this stage when you also break through and disruptive innovation in order to, to save the planet. And you need many other things, including compensation. And you know, that's something that economists are reluctant to do because we think there is one budget for the state. But the problem is that you know, when all, all the green policies, most of them are regressive. That's true for carbon price, but that's true for subsidies for roof, roof panel, for electric cars. Those are regressive policies. And you know, many, many green policies are regressive. So you have to pay attention that you compensate. And it's not an easy thing to do. It's actually very complex to do. But at least, at the very least, you could give a check, a green check to the poor. Um, and then you compensate them in some way. Actually, they are better off, most of them. And you, know, you, you take care of the problem in that way. But it, more generally, and that's a theme of the entire report, not only climate change with Olivier Blanchard, is that you know, we try to pay attention to perceptions. Uh, you cannot just be an economist and think in your itinerary you should be doing that. Um, there's something called political economy and you have to understand why there is a reluctance and why people don't want to have policies which you think are completely obvious and consensual. And there are good reasons for that. It could be motivated beliefs, it could be other cognitive biases, it might be the fact that it doesn't protect the poor, and, you know, protect the losers and so on. If you don't embody that into your public policy, then you don't do the right job. Okay, thank you very much, John. We are running out of time, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for this extremely fascinating presentation uh, a lot of food for thought um, speaking about food i do have some chocolate for you a gift from our school wow. i hope um, you like it i i learned that you are a big fan of chocolate so, so you might like it yes yeah, so I'm, I'm i'm very corruptible so you know <laughs> when it when it when it comes to chocolate uh, i have no willpower and uh, and really I'm sure those are delicious chocolate on top of that, so thanks so much. <laughs> I really appreciate, you know, you, I get the cherry on the cake of having you in this room and uh, discussing with you, but this is another cherry on the cake. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you all for coming to this lecture. And, and see you all, hopefully, for next year's Solari Lecture. So have a good evening, and uh, see you then. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. <laughs>